Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. We know that some communities have the odds stacked against them and have had the odds stacked against them for a very long time, in some cases for decades. And in some communities, that sense of unfairness and powerlessness has contributed Mm -hmm. to dysfunction in those communities. You know, communities are like, are like bodies, and, and, and if, if the immunity system's down, they can get sick. And so Obama's working around the clock in the remaining months of his reign of terror to make certain that he destroys the soldiers of our immune system, the police. I'm a, sort of an expert on the immune system. I wrote a great book on it. I don't know, the year 83, it's a long time ago. Maximum immunity, it was in six languages, Dutch, Swedish, Italian, of course, in English, it was Houghton Mifflin. It was a good book. It was during the AIDS, the height of the AIDS uh, epidemic. And I studied the immune system. And, of course, we compared the white blood cells and the other immune bodies that protect us against invaders to our soldiers, our Marines, our Navy, Coast Guard, and our police. And Obama knows very well that if you take down the immune system, the body can be destroyed. The invaders can take over and destroy the body politic. I am telling you as I sit here, this man is demonic in his desire to destroy the police, the local police in this country, replace them with a federal police force. I was the first one to point this out. It doesn't matter who said it first. We all see it now. And he is now unleashing community organizers on crime-filled cities. This is a new mission He has found $163 million in grants to be distributed to gangs. He calls them community organizations. But let me ask you who the Cincinnati Black United Front is. Let me ask you who the American Civil Liberties Union is. The ACLU is a gang with law degrees. So he's giving them money to tell these groups how to tell the police how to behave, not to tell the police, we back you, Keep the gangs under control. I warned you this was coming. Obama to unleash community organizers on crime-filled cities. You can read it on WND. Now, this ties into a very big story that I touched on yesterday, which was what happened to the local police who opposed Hitler in Germany uh, in the 1930s. You say, well, what does this have to do with that? Obama's not Hitler. No, no, he's not Hitler. Not at all. Not at all. I never said he was Hitler. But he has all the instincts of a dictator all of the dangerous instincts of a dictator and none of the saving graces of a dictator who loves his own country, in my estimation. Now, before I proceed with explaining to you how the Gestapo took over the police, and especially if you're a police officer listening to the Savage Nation, I want you to pay close attention to how they purged the police in America to replace them with stormtroopers. And then I want to address all those in the military who listen to this show around the world Your military has been purged by Obama at the highest levels. He decapitated your leadership uh, right after Benghazi is when he took out some of your best generals. They smeared them and destroyed them. So he feels he owns the military, which is obviously true since they're not fighting ISIS. He now knows that the last nut to crack before going for the people themselves are the local police. Now, you may think I'm a paranoid lunatic, but that's your problem, not mine. And now I want to back up before I continue on how the Gestapo was born in Germany and tell you that something interesting happened last night to awaken me to my own show. After 21 years in radio, I discovered something last night. It's not a vitamin. It's not a book. I went onto the WABC website at night just to I look sometimes at the major station websites to see how I'm presented. And I saw the other hosts, you know, the day part hosts in New York on WABC. And then I went to my site, you know, my Michael Savage. And you can, you can look up the archives for virtually every host. There's something like 870 shows of mine on the WABC website. Uh, going back to 2013 when I began with Cumulus. And I clicked on one of them from the other day. And I was shocked at how perfectly recorded it was 
seamlessly spliced. And I said, wait a minute. As I listened to my own voice on a show I did Monday or Tuesday, something happened inside of me. I said, Michael, do you realize that every word you say is now permanently recorded? It is not the old days of radio where people can say something and then they figure no one heard it, or if they did, they can't capture it. Every word I say, and fact, matter of fact of the matter, anyone in radio, is permanently recorded now. Permanently. It's a permanent record. Moreover, let's say you have a, a politician who hates you, who doesn't have the time to listen to you. His minions, he has thousands of them, can listen, capture something of yours, and send it to the dictator. You understand what I'm saying to you? You get that? So I said, okay, you've kind of known this. So every word that I have said to you and every word that I will say to you from today forward, I believe in. And the best defense against slander is the truth. I believe that everything I have told you and everything I'm about to tell you is the truth, the simple truth. And we will begin now with this issue of taking over the local police by funding so-called community organizers who are fundamentally thugs and gangs. We all know who they are. But before I do that, I want to play a soundbite of the worst, almost a monster. Eric Holder is probably one of the most evil men in American history. And I want you to listen to what this demonic man said before he retired oh, a while ago. Listen to this. One cannot truly understand America without understanding the historical experience of black people in this nation. Simply put, to get to the heart of this country, one must examine its racial soul. Though this nation has proudly thought of itself as a ethnic melting pot, in things racial, we have always been, and we, I believe, continue to be, in too many ways, essentially a nation of cowards. Okay, so we're a nation of cowards because he wants a conversation on race. Well, let's have a conversation on race on the savage nation. We've been having a conversation on race ever since Obama triggered Ferguson. We've been having a conversation on race ever since Holder and Obama triggered the burning of Baltimore. We've been having a conversation on race ever since we've seen what this administration is doing and intends to do. So I say let's continue our cowardly discussion of race on the program. And there's no better way to continue this conversation of race, uh, this, this cowardly conversation of race, is uh, then to focus on what Obama just did last night. Remember Loretta Lynch, how the Republicans put up a fake fight and said that they were going to oppose her? Well, she's now in there, and I warned you she was worse than a holder. Didn't I tell you she was going to be worse than a holder because she's a woman? She's got a double going for her. She's got a double protexia around her. So now she announces immediately not that she's going to look into disarming the gangs in the cities. Not that she's going to look into the communist front groups that were responsible for all the violence and the terrorism in our streets. But she's going to grant $163 million to these, these thuggish groups. The ACLU is a criminal organization, as you know, with law degrees. They're the cowardly side of the, of the uh, revolution. The ACLU are the cowards who hide behind law degrees. They work with the actual street thugs who do the damage. Do you understand how this works? So she's going to put in new guidelines in cities to teach police how to behave toward the gangs. Now that leads us to the Gestapo is born. Upon becoming Chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler had appointed Hermann Goering as Minister of the Interior for the state of Prussia. As Minister of the Interior, Goering thereby had control of the police. That's the Attorney General. She's the, she's the fundamentally the Minister of the Interior. The Attorney General is our Minister of the Interior. So in Germany, Goering had control of the police. She doesn't have control of our local police because we have a constitution, we have state governments, which are supposed to function separately from the federal government to avoid a dictatorship. But we have a man who was a madman in the White House, surrounded by demagogues who want to take over every aspect of our lives. The first thing Goring did was to prohibit regular, uniformed police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out in the streets. So I said, well, what does that have to do with America? There are no Nazi brown shirts. Yes, there are. They're the gangs. They're the thugs who just burnt Baltimore. They are the brown shirts. They burnt Baltimore 
First they tried Ferguson and they got away with it. Then they had the president covering for them, putting out the false narrative of the gentle giant who was actually a criminal trying to kill a cop. So he covered for them, and these thugs are now controlling Ferguson and Baltimore. And so let's go back again to history, Goring. First thing he did was prohibit regular uniform police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out in the streets. This meant that innocent German citizens had no one to turn to as they were being beaten up by rowdy young stormtroopers. Well, do we have stormtroopers? No, we don't have rowdy young stormtroopers. We have rowdy young thugs, inner city thugs. And what did these young stormtroopers do? These young Nazi toughs took full advantage of police leniency to loot shops at will and terrorize Jews or anyone else unfortunate enough to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, did they loot in Ferguson? You betcha. Did they loot in Baltimore? You betcha. Did they terrorize people? You betcha. So what's the parallel, boys and girls? The Gestapo was born in Germany. Obama is giving birth to a Gestapo in America. His gangs are called victims. The police are called thugs. He's reversed everything. Now, that's, that's just one topic I want to handle today. Not, I'm not going to do this for three hours. Another one, because you want substance, I'll give you substance. You want substance, you're going to get substance. The other day I listed 16 questions or so, 13 questions, uh, for you to answer on a Gmail account. It was the uh, savageanswer at gmail.com. And by and large, I've gotten remarkably great answers to these very important national questions. And one of them came from a high-ranking military officer stationed in the Middle East for seven years who is a West Point graduate, graduate who will remain anonymous. He has amazing answers to these questions that are plaguing all of us. And he listens to the Savage Nation daily through YouTube.com. And he says, I thoroughly enjoy your analysis of the issues and the occasional comedic interjects, injects. He said, I heard about the opportunity to provide some input to your next book, so attached you'll find my take on a few of the questions you pose on your website. If you decide to include my thoughts, please don't make them attributable to me until I retire in 2017, beat Navy, and I'll leave his name out of it. Very high-ranking military officer. We're going to read his answer and others because I'm not just going to sit here and complain. I'm going to give you solutions. And then I want to make an announcement before I take my first break. As you can see, I'm very excited today. Countdown to Mecca is doing very well in the bookstores, thank you. It had a great first week. I made a decision last night. I'm going to donate a large percentage, and I'll figure out exactly how much of all royalties from that book to the Savage Scholarship Fund and the Savage Legal Fund. And if you want to remember what I've done with the Savage Legal Fund, I bought a car for that soldier who was separated from his dog who came back wounded, Mr. Gromit. I think it was $20,000. We sent him a $20,000 check. I am going to replenish that fund with some royalties from this book, Countdown to Mecca, so you'll know that I'm not trying to enrich myself. I don't own 10,000 apartments in Atlanta. All I own is my integrity. I'm Michael Savage. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Today we're also releasing new policies on the military-style equipment that the federal government uh, has in the past provided to state and local law enforcement agencies. And we've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like it was an occupying force as opposed to a force that's part of the community that's protecting them and serving them. Can alienate and intimidate local residents and send the wrong message. So we're going to prohibit some equipment made for the battlefield that is not appropriate for local police departments. Well, those that do not know the history are condemned to repeat it, so I'm giving you a little historical music, the Horst Vessel song of the uh, Nazi party. Uh, as a little background music to the uh, soft-spoken president of the United States of America circa 2014, 2015. Of course he's not a Nazi. Are you crazy? Why, there are no concentration camps. Not at all. There are no brown shirts in the streets. Not at all. It's done for, um, let us say, attracting your attention. And maybe you'll break through the fog of confusion, doubt, and illusion. The illusion created by the grand illusionist Barack Obama. 
Barack Obama is the greatest illusionist in the history of the presidency. Make no mistake about it, he's a grand illusionist. And instead of screaming in German, he talks softly. And he threatens everyone in the United States of America on a daily basis with his reign of terror while not threatening ISIS. ISIS is taking over one city after another. And he and his sorority are telling us that they don't stay awake worrying about it at night. It's nothing. You hear this? The world is burning and he's attacking American police. So I want to go back to how the Gestapo was born in Germany. So maybe you'll understand the danger we are in. Because Obama and uh, Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, have announced... They're giving out $163 million to community organizations like the Cincinnati Black United Front and the ACLU to take over the police and teach them how to behave. Community organizers on crime-filled streets. So what does that have to do with Germany, 1930s, and Hitler? Well, you listen and figure it out. Okay, I gave you the background. In the beginning, first thing Goring did as a minister of the interior, the attorney general at the time, was prohibit regular uniform police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out on the streets. So the brown shirts were able to take advantage of police leniency, to loot shops at will, terrorize anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's your inner city gangs. That's what just happened in Ferguson and Baltimore and New York. Next, what happened next? All you geniuses. Next, Goring purged the Berlin Police Department of all politically unreliable cops, and he had 50,000 stormtroopers sworn in as special police auxiliaries. So what happened then? Well, then the stormtroopers, meaning the thugs from our streets, had the power to arrest, and they relished its use. Jails were soon overflowing with people taken into protective custody, resulting in the need for large outside prison camps. The birth of the concentration camp system. It happened step by step, stage by stage, day by day, month by month, year by year, right in front of the German people's eyes. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. stacked against them and have had the odds stacked against them for a very long time, in some cases for decades. And in some communities, that sense of unfairness and powerlessness has contributed to dysfunction in those communities. You know, communities are like, are like bodies, and, and, and if, if the immunity system's down, they can get sick. Fascism goes on right in front of our eyes by the Grand Illusionist. Uh, for two segments now, I've been showing you what happened in Germany, how the Gestapo, that's the secret police, were born under Hitler, and how Obama is step by step, stage by stage, copying the same playbook. You say, oh, come on, you're crazy. Well, then I'm crazy. Have me, have, me, have me locked up and put into a state mental hospital so you can listen to the fools who say it's not happening doesn't have to be an exact parallel to be a parallel, does it? So he, appoint, he appointed as Minister of the Interior Goring to control the police. Obama appoints his attorney general, first holder the fascist, and now Loretta Lynch, fascist junior, to attack the local police. That's the first thing Loretta Lynch did. The first thing the fascist in a skirt did was go after the police in America. Make no mistake about it. She didn't go after the gangs after Baltimore. She went after the police. So which side is she on? So what did Goring, the equivalent of Loretta Lynch, do when he took power? He prohibited regular uniform police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out in the street. What does that mean? Who are the Nazi brown shirts? What are you, crazy, savage? The thugs in Baltimore. The thugs in Ferguson. The ones who robbed convenience stores. The one, ones who burnt the cities down. The ones who beat up the police. They're the brown shirts. And instead of the government attacking them, and giving the police new powers to arrest and detain them, they took more powers away from the police. So the young brown shirts looted shops at will and terrorized anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. What happened next? Next, Goring purged the Berlin Police Department of politically unreliable cops, and he had 50,000 stormtroopers sworn in as special police auxiliaries. If Obama moves to that next stage where he permits 
community groups to police themselves, we will say the next step is in place. They are the stormtroopers. And what happened after that was stormtroopers had power of arrest and they relished its use. They arrested people under the guise of protective custody. The prisons were overflowing. They needed to create outside prison camps, the birth of the concentration camp system. So what did he do next? Goring next turned his attention to the plainclothes police. On April 26, 1933, a decree was issued creating the secret police office, Geheime Polizei Amt, which quickly became known as the GPA. The name was changed to Secret State Police, Geheim Staatspolizei. Gestapo was derived from seven letters within the full name, Geheim Staatspolizei. G-E-S-T-A-P-O. Gestapo was derived from the seven letters within the full name of Geheime Staatspolizei. Polizei. Goring promptly began using the Gestapo to silence Hitler's political opponents in Berlin and surrounding areas and also to enhance his own personal power. And so what did he do? Well, to his great delight, Hermann Goring discovered that the old Prussian state police had kept many secret files on the private lives of top Nazis, which he studied with delight. Let's pause right there. Uh, tell me where the secret files on the private lives of top Republicans are, and for that matter, top Democrats. Do you remember Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, the FBI files? Do you remember them stealing the FBI files? Remember they disappeared? Those are the secret files. That's why the Republicans are silent. That's one estimation of why. It doesn't have to be the reason. It could be plain cowardice and greed on their part as well. It could be as simple as they're just greedy, greedy dirtbags. They're just greedy dirtbags interested only in advancing the financial uh, advantages of their contributors, the Republicans. So it could be that. It could be the secret files on the private lives of top Nazis. What happened next? February 10, 1936, Nazi Reichstag passed the Gestapo law, which included the following paragraph. Listen carefully, all you lovers of Obama, the, uh, the leader of America. Neither the instructions nor the affairs of the Gestapo will be open to review by the administrative courts. Didn't he just do that with the trade agreement with uh, Asia? Didn't he have a secret file in the basement of Congress that no one could look at except Congress? The press couldn't see it. And then the members of Congress could not even take notes and bring them out of there. Obama has every instinct of a dictator. Neither the instructions nor the affairs of the Gestapo will be open to review by the administrative courts. What this meant was the Gestapo became a group above the law and there was no legal appeal regarding anything it did. Does it sound familiar to you? Do you feel powerless no matter what this character does with his little pen? There's no appeal beyond him. And what happened next? Well, the Gestapo became a law unto itself. And so people could be arrested for no reason, interrogated for no reason, and sent to a concentration camp for incarceration or summary execution without any outside legal procedure. Well, we're a long way from that, aren't we? Pause. Someone could be arrested in America now for what? Interrogated for what? For what? I don't know. Maybe you disagree with some of his policies and you're a threat to national security. Maybe that'll be a new law of Loretta Lynch. The uh, Grand Illusionist put out a thing on climate change last night that has people who are sane shaking their heads saying, he says, climate change causes allergies, asthma, downpours, poverty, and terrorism. Now, you'd have to create this as a fictional script for a country that's gone mad that has an insane leader to believe that a president would be able to get away with this after failing on every front. ISIS who is in, 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 in incorporating slavery, kidnapping, murder, destroying artifacts going back a thousand years. This is what this demented fool is doing? He's giving a speech on climate change to the Coast Guard? Yes, he did. He did. He says that's a part of readiness, is uh, dealing with climate change. Listen to clip one. This is your leader. Climate change poses a threat to the readiness of our forces. Many of our military installations are on the coast, Liar. including, of course, our coast guard You know he doesn't stations. believe. Stop. Around you know, I want you to listen to his voice. He is reading a script written for him by some very dangerous, demented people, evil people, and he doesn't believe a word of it. I want you to listen to the hollowness of the grand illusionist. Play clip one. Climate change poses a threat to the readiness of our forces. Many of our military installations are on the coast, including, of course, our coast guard stations around Norfolk. High tides and storms increasingly flood parts of our Navy base 
and an air base. In Alaska, thawing permafrost is damaging military facilities. Out west, deeper droughts and longer wildfires could threaten training areas our troops depend on. So politicians who say they care about military readiness ought to care about this as well. This is his problem. Not those who rape, kill, pillage, take over cities and enslave hundreds of thousands of people. Not one of the greatest displacements of a population in modern American times caused by his failed policies in the Middle East. No, he's talking about seawalls. He's seawalls now and uh, global warming taking over the world. Well, I rest my case. It's now time for you, the listener, to be heard from. But before I go to you, because I'm not out of steam, I'm just building up out of steam, I want to turn to uh, answers to the questions that I posed on michaelsavage.com, possibly to be included in my next nonfiction book. I want to read some of the solutions that people have out there instead of just complaining about the emerging maniac, the maniac's emerging fascism, rather. And I'd also like to reiterate that uh, Countdown to Mecca, the novel, all royalties that I get, I'll give, I figured out what I'm talking about here. Any royalties I earn beyond my advance, I will give 50% to my Savage Legal Fund and the Savage Scholarship Fund, period, end of story. That's a commitment, write it down, it's permanent, that's in permafrost. So if you want to do good and you want to enjoy yourself, you want to support the show, I suggest you go and grab the book before it's buried completely. It's a great book, by the way, someone who really reads thrillers, who reads three of them a week, wrote an interesting email last night to me. I don't think I can find it in a moment's notice. No, I can't find it. It's very hard for me to do this while doing a show, but I, I might be able to. I'll find it. Don't give me a second. I like doing I like multitasking. It challenges me and frightens me. It makes me, here it is. Savage, your book Countdown to Mecca is, <laughs> to Mecca is good. Very interesting plot twists. The characters are believable and compelling. Very good descriptions of the characters enable the reader to become engaged with the sentiment and the plot. Congratulations, Savage. This is a fine book. I cannot foresee the ending, which is very important. It keeps the reader involved. I got another one later on on Countdown to Mecca from someone who said one line. It is a very good book. You should be very proud of this effort. It's very hard to tell a complicated story like this in multiple geographies. Countdown to Mecca. So it's set in several countries. Characters are... It's kind of, I think it's too many characters for the average uh, audience of the thriller genre. In fact, what I did was, because I'm a complicated man with a complicated mind, I like complicated stories, I created too many characters, perhaps, for the average reader. They like one to two characters. It should be Sy Sylvester Stallone and two people around him, and then uh, a Barbie doll girl who is also a martial artist and a machine gun expert who's also a sex kitten. That would be about the most the average American could handle in the Weinstein mind, the, the mind of the Weinsteinites, Weinsteinites out, out there. So what I did was I put in the front of the book what I used to see in Russian novels, a cast of characters. I explained them in the front so you could go back and forth. Did you look at this yet, Robert? You got your book, right? Cast of characters, Jack Catfield, Doc Batson, Dover Griffith, Sammy Michaels, Saul Minsky, Boaz Simpson, Rick, Carl For Forsyth, Piotr Ansky, Thomas Brooks, Montgomery Morton, Stephen Reynolds, Andrew Taylor, Anastasia Vincent, Ritu Miwa, Daniel Jeffries, Helmut Schoenberg, and Bernie Peters. So that you have your little cast of characters, and it reads like an old-fashioned novel. So if you're literate and you like real books, I recommend that you grab it as soon as you can, because we're getting reports that, yes, it's there, but you're not going to believe what you're about to hear. John, are you there? John has gone with the wind. It's okay. People come, people go. Let's go to the next callers. Uh, book from 1964. No, I don't want to do that. WMAL in Washington, D.C. Debbie, thanks for joining us. What's on your mind? Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for taking my call. I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate you, you educating people about the, the comparison between Nazi Germany and what we're facing right now. When, when he made, gave that speech on July 17, 2008, about starting the civilian security. Yes, the private national security force, right. The very famous speech that people thought was an anomaly, yes. Yes, I, I immediately bristled and thought, whoa, what is he... But, but what, what strikes me is like... This is part of his agenda. Part of his agenda is to disarm the police, federalize those who are 
compatible with his new fascist policies and eliminate anyone who opposes his fascism and then call them a new, a new uh, uh, let us say, minority-friendly police force, a federal police force that will be friendly and conform with all federal guidelines on fairness. Yep. Well, I actually have a friend who was at a law enforcement, because we have a lot of law enforcement in the family, it was at a law enforcement meeting, and, and they, were, they were discussing um, the, one of the, the things that came down. Like, they were supposed to go to their, 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 their um, other police officers and say, what would you do if we were supposed to round up citizens? And they said what was surprising was about half of them said, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it, we wouldn't partake in it. And the other half, they said mainly it was the younger ones, the under 30s, we're like, okay, you know, whatever we have to do, we'll do. And yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it very clearly. Next, Goring purged the Berlin Police Department of politically unreliable cops and had 50,000 stormtroopers sworn in as special police auxiliaries. Uh, that's sort of what we're talking about. If Obama I, does that, if Obama deputizes these gangs or these community organizers, you will know, you'll know exactly that what I was saying to you today has great validity. Let's leave it at that. I'm not running for office. It's that simple. 855-407-282. What else is in the news? Let's see. Iran, you want to talk about Iran? I'm not interested in those crazy ragheads. Iran's Ayatollah, nuke inspectors will not have access to military sites, nor are scientists. You expected something different from Obama's friends in uh, Shia Iran? Isn't this what he wanted? He wanted a secret deal with, with Iran. And when Congress said, wait a minute, we're Congress. We have a right to see the deal. He said, drop dead. You can't interfere with my deal. And Lurch, his Secretary of State, the most dangerous Secretary of State in history, and that's saying a lot when you consider that we had Madeleine Halfbright, uh, perhaps the worst human being that I've ever seen in the Secretary of State's position, who, uh, I mean, Lurch said, that's right. The president has a right to pass a law, uh, an agreement with uh, Iran without any interference from Congress. So we have a dictatorship in the making. We all warned you that Iran would go ahead with their nuclear weapon on a fast track uh, once he gave this fast track to them. And Iran today said nuke inspectors will not have access to military sites, nor our scientists. And the International Atomic Energy Agency will not be allowed to inspect the facilities. So Obama, in other words, is working hand in glove with the ragheads in Iran to build a nuclear weapon not only to wipe Israel off the map, but possibly to wipe off great Satan, which is us. Think about it, my friends. One day you'll wake up and realize that what I'm about to say is true. A nuclear weapon does not discriminate between a progressive and a conservative. Okay, my friends. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. We've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson and New York, and it has many causes from a basic lack of opportunity Liar. To some groups feeling unfairly targeted by oh, what their a police heartbreak. forces. Yeah, that means there's no single solution. No, there, there is. have to be a lot of different solutions. And different yeah, law and order is the solution, liar. Law and order, that's the solution. Something you don't know. Here's the question. Will Obama be remembered as the first black president or the first president of the blacks? Because every day in every way I hear him segmenting this country and representing only one population in this country. There seems to be a war against the European-American population in this nation, in case you don't know it. Whether it's on the universities, where the vermin talk about white privilege as though it's real, and intimidate your children, and make them hate themselves. Or it's in the streets, with him agitating mobs. Or Hillary agitating La Raza and illegal aliens. Who speaks for the white people? May I ask that question? May I humbly ask you, who speaks for the European Americans who are the majority of this country? Just who speaks for them? Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage.
Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. As men and women in uniform, you know that it can be just as important, if not more important, to prevent threats before they can cause catastrophic harm. And the only way... The only way the world is going to prevent the worst effects of climate change is right to on. slow down the warming of the planet. Right Some on. warming is now inevitable, but there All comes a point the when people. the worst effects will be irreversible and time right is running out. Right on! As the grand illusionist, the worst commander-in-chief imaginable, if you hired a nine-year-old child with a toy gun to be the commander-in-chief, he couldn't do a worse job than the grand illusionist is doing, in my opinion. Here we have ISIS taking over one major city after another, and this clown is talking about climate change posing a threat uh, to national security. Only in America could it get away with it because we no longer have a fourth estate. We have a fifth column with a single party of left-wing demagogues running everything from top to bottom. Welcome to the show, hour number two. Hour number one I spent explaining to you in some detail what went on in Germany in the 1930s on the birth of the Gestapo under Adolf Hitler, how it was done sta step by step, st step by step, stage by stage. And I compared it to what he's doing to our police in this country, uh, step by step, day by day, city by city. I'm not going to repeat myself. It'll be up on the, uh, I suppose it'll be webcast, however they do this, podcast on various and sundry websites before the end of the day. And uh, I suggest you listen to it. And share it with people. You're very lucky that you have me on the radio. I rarely blow my own horn. People think I'm very egotistical and I do too much of it. But you actually don't know I don't do much of it at all. The thing is, is that were it not for the quirks of the socialist government that you're living in, you wouldn't even be hearing me. I would have been a college professor of ethnobotany and never heard from, except in scholarly circles. But because they cauterized me through the fascism of liberalism, and drove me away from the universities, I come before you fully developed and fully educated in so many areas. And as a result, I see the truth and I don't wait. Now, it has been written that God sees the truth but waits. Thomas Mann wrote that in one of his novel, short stories. I was very impressed with it. And it was about the nihilism of Germany after World War I, before uh, the Nazis arose, during the liberal Weimar Republic. The country was out of control. Liberalism had destroyed the social order. Uh, young gangs were roving the streets of Germany doing what they're doing today in America. And it was fascism that came along because the people were demanding law and order. And now we have the grand illusionist that we're dealing with. And I, you know what's hard for me to believe? Is that every day he gets worse. It's not as though, see this is a pathology here we're dealing with. We're actually dealing with a very ill man. He is so demonically ill that he doesn't even realize what does he realize what he's doing i ask myself every day how can a man get up every day and while looking at himself in the you get up wash your face go to the bathroom you look at yourself in the mirror you comb your hair brush your teeth whatever does he say to himself what can i do to destroy white america today how can i destroy the power structure every day how can i weaken this country even further is that what he's doing? Because there's no other explanation for his activities. It's as though a man wakes up every day and says, how can I weaken the European-American dominance of this country? How can I make this country less racist, which is a code word for weakening white America? I'm sorry, you want a conversation on race? Didn't Eric Holder say we're cowards? Didn't Eric Holder say that we're too cowardly to have a discussion on race? Well, let's have a discussion on race. He wants us to talk about it. I am talking about it. I am so sick and tired of hearing how evil white men are. I am so sick and tired of hearing how oppressed the black people are. I am so sick and tired of hearing how great every Hispanic is that I want to have a conversation on race. So that's what we're doing. We're having a conversation on race. Since Eric Holder said that we're all cowards on it. White men are evil. Hispanics are all Einsteins. And black men are all oppressed. 
That's the, that's the narrative every day. And your poor daughter goes to college. This poor child you gave birth to has to go and listen to these communist cockamamie lunatics who tell her she has white privilege. She could have multiple sclerosis and come from a poor home. They'll tell her if she's European American, she has white, white privilege. That's what your daughter has to put up with, this massive Soviet-style propaganda under this grand illusionist. So that's the opening to hour number two. What do you want me to talk about? You want me to talk about, I have other subjects, I can do them. I can shift gears. So I'll tell you what I will do is I'll shift gears. I'll shift gears because I realize histrionics only work up to a point. And I looked into something to do with radio the other day that's very interesting. The business of radio is an interesting business. It's, it lives on ratings. It lives and falls on ratings. And we can't give you the exact numbers. We're not allowed to. But I look at a few markets to see how I'm doing. I've had ups and downs. But for a while now, my show, I look at a major market like New York City on WABC of the 250 stations. And how am I doing compared to other day part shows? And there was a dip last month, but I'm still number one in, in Cume. So in other words, although the talk format went down, I still maintain my dominance. So what does that tell me? It tells me I'm doing the right thing. My audience is still listening to me. That's all I know. There's nothing else I can do. My core audience still listens to me because they like Michael Savage. They like my mind. They like my delivery. They like my passion. And uh, I'll keep doing it. I'm not going to suddenly become what I'm not. Others have to decide whether what they're selling is being purchased or not. And you'll have to decide whether what they're selling is worth buying. That's, you know, it's a long day here. It's not my job to kill others in the business. I don't have to defeat others in order for me to survive. Do you understand that? People don't understand that. Some talk shows think that they have to dominate everybody else in order to survive in their three hours. I understand through wisdom that there's an awful long day and you need an, you need an audience all day long and they need an audience all day long. So all I care about is my three hours. And make believe I'm a truck driver. On the back of my truck, it's 1-800-HOW'S-MY-DRIVING. I think my driving's pretty good. All I know is that days, there are days I wake up. I've had good ones, by the way, this week. It's been a very good week for me, despite some physical problems, emotional problems, psychological problems, philosophical problems, issues that every man has to deal with every day. What you have to do is get up. You have to get yourself together, focus everything, and do the show. And not worry about what came before it, and not worry about what comes after it. Don't worry about the black hole of life that follows radio. These three hours, I float like a butterfly, or I soar like an eagle. I fly like an eagle for three hours. Some days I soar higher than others, and I think I'm doing a fine job for you today. And I hope you're enjoying it. And most of you who listen to me on a daily basis for many, many years can tell by my voice how I'm feeling. And I will say that many of you know that I'm feeling quite good right now. Here's an email I got. It's from Shomer Yisrael. Dear Dr. Savage, firstly, I must thank you for keeping me company on my way home from work the past 15 years and wish you many more years on the radio with even more success. Secondly, I have to say that there were many times I wished to myself that if only I could be on the phone with you, how I would say something about the subject but that never happened because the lines were so busy. With regards to your questions on how to save America, we all know only God can help us, but since you asked, I will give you my answers. And he gives me the answers to 13 questions, which I'm not going to read you because it would, it would probably stop the show in its tracks. And uh, you can look at the questions on michaelsavage.com and send your answers. It's a small contest, but an important one, I think. Questions for Savage Nation listeners. And uh, I'm going to include the best answers in a book that's coming out next October. Yes, I'm always writing. Never, never forget one thing about Michael Savage. I began as a writer. And Ecclesiastes, one of the great books of the Old Testament, says, of the making of many books, there is no end. It's that simple. That's what I do. I was once in a barber chair when I used to go to barbers. I don't go to barbers anymore. Instead, I just got a ponytail. And... Um, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm growing a ponytail now. I decided I'm going to be one of those ponytail older guys. I look good, though. They don't look good with them. Old, other older guys look terrible with ponytails. I look good with one. <laughs> so we, we all think we look good. But, you know, you got to keep up your act. So I like the way I look. So I don't go to barbers anymore, except to get a little trim. So I was once sitting in a barber chair in San Francisco. Nice guy. I haven't gone there in a while. 
And I said, you know, I'm exhausted. I don't want to write it. This is right after Abuse of Power. I'm talking five years ago. I said, I don't think I can write another book. You know what he said to me? Yes, you will. He said, I said, why? He said, that's what you do. He said, I cut hair and you write books. And you know what? I wrote another book. He's right. What, I should be intimidated by a tin horn, a tin horn lawyer? I should be intimidated by a government agent who doesn't have a scintilla of talent? I'm not going to be intimidated by people who don't have my talent into trying to mock me. I won't do it. I won't feel, I won't fall for that. So anyway, to go back to the show, I'll take some calls. I'll uh, give you additional insights in how the Gestapo was born and what Ob Obama and Loretta Lynch and the left wing is trying to do to our local police. You've heard other people say, yeah, they're trying to federalize the police. Fine. I said it before anyone else. But today I gave you the details of it. I just didn't give you the golfer's vision of it. I didn't give you a golf view on a golf course. I gave you the details of how the Gestapo was born under Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goring. And I showed you the comparisons between Barack Obama and Loretta Lynch. I showed you step by step, plan by plan, day by day. Now, if it's too much for you, I accept that. I accept it. I look around, I see people in the streets, they don't want to know any of this. I have neighbors who are the biggest idiots I've ever seen in my life. They don't listen to the radio. They don't watch television. They actually proudly say, well, I don't no, I, I don't watch TV news. I don't listen to no radio. I only listen to NPR. Good for you. Good for you. National Public Radio. You mean National Obama Radio, don't you? you remember there was a day when the Republican Party tried to defund NPR? What happened to those days? Why would they defund NPR a number of years ago because they knew that it was an unfair advantage that they had. They could run a station with, with talentless fools who they pay extraordinary salaries with no ads and get super high ratings. If I did three hours of radio with no ads, my ratings would be double. Do you know that? Think about that. Think about the disadvantage we have in commercial radio. Because of the wonderful sponsors we have, we have lower ratings than those without sponsors. So those schmucks who are on NPR think they're geniuses because they have a four share with no, advertise, with no advertisers interrupting their flow of, of Obama propaganda. So I want you to understand something. Without my advertisers, there'd be no show. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Here's another story. The Department of Justice official says slavery to blame for riots in Ferguson and Baltimore. I'm not making it up. Uh, a creature called Vanita Gupta, head of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, Zeke Heil, has told a lawyer's group in Colorado that slavery and Jim Crow helped fuel the Ferguson and Baltimore riots. And then they attacked the local police again. Goes along with my main story. Every way they can, they attack the police and attack the uh, popular, the, excuse me, the dominant culture of the society. Let's go to the caller's Akil on my home street. My hometown station of San Francisco, KSFO. Akil, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? How are you doing, Dr. Savage? First off, I'd like to say you change my thought, my thought process of Democrat and Republican, conservative. My dad used to listen to you, and uh, it's funny. He passed. It's funny that I, I listen to you now. But what I really want to talk about is I'm a American, a black American, and the hypocrisy I see within the black community that's going on. Um, no, first of all, you had a father, number one, at home who listened to the radio with you. That's a huge difference, not only in the black community, but every community. How many white fathers are at home listening to the radio with their kids? I doubt many are. But the thing is, you have your own views of the world. So where's the hypocrisy in the, in the African-American community, in your mind? Is that we're sitting up here, uh, we all, it's like we're taught to blame the white man. Yes, we know that there's racism. It's racism with every race and culture. Thank you. Right. That's a fact of reality. Most, most races like their own race. Exactly. And the thing we don't understand is, we're killing ourselves, young black men. We're killing each other. You know, uh, there's no fathers in the home. 
uh, it did. All right, I understand. So you you feel that blaming the white man for the problems of the black community is a complete red herring. It has no meaning whatsoever. I wouldn't say it doesn't have uh, no meaning, but we can't just keep holding on to that. We're, we're, right, right. So how how does it help you to walk around feeling that is what you're saying? I don't know how it advances anything. It, it doesn't. You know, I, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, there are injustices and there were worse injustices. But to walk around remembering that and carrying that around in your head like it's the only thing in your life basically advances nothing and imprisons the person. I think that is what you're trying to say. Would that be a fair analogy of what you're trying to say? Yes, it is. And then I just real quick. Then, wait, wait, hold on. I just want to make sure that, that, that I'm not paraphrasing you in, in an inaccurate manner. So I appreciate that fact. How, when did your father pass? He passed about three years ago. And how old was he when he died? He was 68. So he, well, he, was, a, he, was, a young, he was a young man. So you grew up listening to me on KSFO in San Francisco with your father saying, listen to this guy, he's not so bad? Yes, sir. He said, Bobby said he's not so. I bet he said he's not so bad for a white man. Well, he. <laughs> I bet he said that at some time, right? Yeah, he he never looked at it that way. He said, "No, I'm serious." You know what he liked? He liked the reality. He knew that with me, he was going to get it like it is. Meaning, at least this guy says what he thinks. I think that's what he liked about the show. Am I right? Yes, sir. And Dr. In other words, in other words, he says it like he sees it. So if you agree, you agree. You don't agree, you don't agree. But at least you have a, ch a chance to react to the guy because he's not giving you the BS job. I'm sorry, but there goes the clock again. I'm sending you a wonderful gift. Countdown to Mecca hardcover will arrive in your house. You'll have a wonderful, wonderful read uh, over the long Memorial Day weekend. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. You think I'm going to cook a hot dog, a burger, play with the dog? Yeah, probably. Watch television, grouse about the world. Yeah, that's what I'll probably do. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. If we as a society aren't willing to deal honestly with issues of race, then we can't just expect police departments to solve these problems. If communities are being isolated and segregated without opportunity and without investment and without jobs. Why is he stirring the pot of racial enmity in America? Have we ever had a president who's done this on such a regular basis? What does he hope to achieve by stir stirring up racial enmity in America? Those are three questions I would ask you to think about over the next few days. And the only conclusion you only conclusions you can come up with are bad. There's no conclusion that is good. It's all bad. It's all demagoguery. It's what he has used to get where he is today. He's going to continue doing it until the day he leaves office. If he leaves office, which is becoming increasingly doubtful, given the fact that there is no opposition party, and virtually no opposition to anything he does. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Gornished. Zilch. Nothing. Nothing. Even his trade deal with Asia, which is a complete sellout of the working person in America. The unions opposed it. Real liberals still oppose it. The Republicans are for it, and he's for it. So what does that tell you? It tells you that he's a Machiavellian uh, grand illusionist. He pretends he's for the downtrodden and the poor but he is actually answering only to those with 414-foot yachts, like Paul Allen, who was in uh, Cannes after the uh, festival, in uh, the film festival. He had a party on his yacht where all of the other uh, downtrodden masses partied the night away on Paul Allen's 414-foot yacht. There was Sean Penn, who talks against guns, who uh, glorifies uh, guns and beatings and knivings and stabbings. His new girlfriend is the woman who portrayed a vicious killer in one movie after another, Charlize Theron. Classic liberals, classic Gulfstream liberals, uh, partying the night away. So the fact of the matter is, those are Obama's friends. That's his real constituency. They fund him. They fund the Republican Party. There's no difference between the two parties when it comes to the funding of the two parties. The only difference is, is that they want more power than they already have because... 
uh, power corrupts absolutely, and Obama is absolutely corrupted, if you look at him. And so he will use any form of demagoguery to advance his power structure. Whether it's him or his own minions, it doesn't really matter. The power structure that is his will remain in place after he's out of office. Look at, look at Bill Clinton. How long has that criminal, I mean, how's, how long has that ex-president been out of office? Has he given up any power? Look what he's done since he was president. Take a look at what Bill Clinton did since he was president. Has he really stopped what he was doing as president? No, only now he's profiting from it personally. In other words, the very same Machiavellian maneuvers that Clinton was using before he's doing now, only he's getting paid to do it and sticking it in the library, the slush fund. Instead of putting it all into his kitty, he puts it into the library and withdraws from it as needed. It's a bank. In other words, the Clinton Foundation is a bank. And you take from it as you need it. And you pay no taxes on it until you withdraw from it. You don't. Let's say a man gives you $10 million, like George uh, uh, Staphylococcus, whatever he gave him, 75 grand. God knows more will come up soon. Let's say a guy gives him $10 million. It doesn't go into Clinton's pocket. You have to pay taxes on it. So it goes into the library tax-free. And he withdraws it as he needs it for his own expenses, an airplane ride, or this, a party, or that. Or that da, 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 da. It's a bank, a tax-free bank. You only get taxed on the way when you, when you withdraw money from it. So has Clinton stopped doing what he was doing? No. He's just doing it for personal profit. Obama will not stop when he leaves office, if he leaves office. His agenda, his radical anti-white agenda will continue, and it'll be rich whites who are funding it. Isn't that interesting? You want another comparison from history? Unfortunately, I have to go back to Germany again. Yes, I'm sorry, there's an awful lot to be learned from history. Who do you think it was who funded Adolf Hitler in the beginning? Huge industrialists like the Krupp Steelworks. Now, why did the Krupp Steelworks go with this street agitator, Adolf Hitler? Because they saw he was the future. And they figured if he was going to run the country, they wanted to make sure they were on the right side of him. And so they profited greatly, the Krupp Steelworks, in the rearmament of Germany. After all, they were building the planes, the ships, the tanks, uh, the artillery, the uh, ammunition. So Krupp loved him. What was a problem for Hitler in the beginning was that he was a socialist, national socialism. Never forget he was a socialist. Okay, but he wasn't a real socialist. The real socialists were those in the SA. Ernst Röhm was a pure, 100% pure socialist. And he came to, he came to fight with Hitler once he has seized the absolute power, once Hitler had achieved absolute power, Ernst Röhm, the gay head of the, of the SA, the stormtroopers, got into a real power struggle with Hitler because Ernst Röhm and his SA wanted pure socialism. They did not want to reward the capitalists, for example, in Krupp Steelworks. Hitler couldn't accept that. Hitler was far more intelligent than the brown shirts. He wasn't a purist by any means. He was just a maniac who wanted pure power and had hatred for certain races and certain people. So what happened? He killed SA uh, leadership on the Night of the Long Knives. He took over the SA and dissolved them into the SS because he no longer had, at that point, he no longer had the competition of those purists who wanted pure socialism, who wanted to disconnect with the uh, industrialists like Krupp Steelworks. Maybe that's a little too long for you in the seminar tonight. I get it. And I have to ask myself every day, how far do you really want to go with this? How much of the history that I know do I want to share with you? Some of you love it. You eat it up. You say, that's great. Some of you say, you know, it's enough already. Talk about the dog. And I get it. I said, big show. You know, I got to deal with the intellectual. I got to deal with this Joe Six Pack. I got to deal with the angry minority. I got to deal with the illegal immigrant who hears one out of 12 words. I got to deal with the children. I got to deal with the infirm. I, this is what you do when you're in public, in a public place. Never forget that as familial and as friendly as I may sound to you, I am fundamentally, uh, <clears throat> I'm a broadcaster, broadcasting my ideas, casting broadly my ideas casting broadly my ideas across America and through the internet now across the world. So there's an audience of millions of people. We all have that in the national level. Some have more millions than others, but it's millions. It doesn't matter how many millions. And amongst the millions, you have the, the very well-educated, very critical, very cynical, a very well-read audience. You have all the way down to the illiterate audience. And then below them, you have those who simply... Rep support Republicans and attack Democrats. 
That is the base audience of talk radio. Republican good. Oh, Republican good. Why, we? We once owned California. Oh, yeah, we Republicans. Yeah, we Republicans. Anytime you hear a talk show host say, we Republicans, put an X to that talk show host. Because they're a front for the Republican Party. How many different ways do I have to tell you that? Stop being gold. Very few people in the media are as independent as I am. It's a miracle that I'm still on the radio, given the independent level of my thinking. I'm a free thinker. Almost unheard of in this country. Almost unheard of in the world. I'm one of the last few free thinkers on the planet. And so, therefore, as an endangered species, I have to decide in listening to my own words sometimes... You know, did I go too far? Did I say too much? I don't know. I actually don't have an answer for that. I know that, you know, I'm still blacklisted in England, even though Cameron won. I expected them to send uh, a mission to America and apologize to me and say, Dr. Savage, as the new conservative leader of Britain, we hereby invite you before Parliament to give a speech on freedom of speech. And here's a check for the uh, $500,000 that caught you. Uh, cost you to try and free your name from that dastardly list created by our laborite enemies. Uh, and here is a pass to all of the great British food that you have missed over the last six years. And here is another free pass to a free dental service in the British Health Service so you can finally have your teeth fixed. <laughs> but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I'm still a wonderful fan of, uh, the, uh, I, I still admire the British people. I don't know why. It's, it's based on World War II footage. What British? There are no British people. Where are they? Drunk women with their skirts up in the gutters of, uh, of Soho? That, that's, the, that's the British people. Fat women with their skirts up, drunk, throwing up in the gutter. That, that's what happened to the great British Empire. The men, I don't know where they are, beating each other. I don't know what they're doing. You still see some of these gigantic throwbacks. They're the ones who should take over the country. Because it's only the soccer thug who can save England. I've said that a hundred times. But the soccer thug is now uh, hated more than is the Islamist thug, if you can believe it. Same thing going on there that's going on here. The leaders, in other words, are the Indian chiefs who sold out their own tribes in both England and here. Indian chiefs, remember, sold out the Indian. They blamed the white man, but it was the Indian chiefs who sold the Indian out for wampum, some booze, right? Whatever else they got, they, got, they sold the tribes out. So here we are. I'm not sitting complaining. Borders, has borders, language, and culture become illegal? Has it become illegal for me to talk about borders, language, and culture? Well, it banned me from entering England, the same country that released the Libyan terrorist who was convicted of blowing up Pan Am Flight 103. The Libyan went home to a hero's welcome, and Michael Savage was left to suffer in silence. I am not a victim. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you what's going on. Nothing changed since Cameron became prime minister of england nothing will change nothing will change so i continue <clears throat> to read my history and try to learn from it and you say well what's the good of it if no one else is learning from it you gave a wonderful discourse today on, on, on how the gestapo was born in germany you made comparisons between the minister of interior herman goring and the uh, attorney generals of the united states and what they did to the police Step by step, day by day, you compared the brown shirts to the thugs in Ferguson and Baltimore who were looting shops the way the uh, w looting shops at will without being arrested the way the brown shirts did. And the next step you said was Goring or the Attorney General purging the police departments of politically unreliable cops and replacing them with stormtroopers. Well, we have no stormtroopers, right? So that can't happen. Yes, you do have stormtroopers. The gangs of America, the thugs in the streets, are Obama's future stormtroopers if ever they are deputized if ever they are given the power to control their own streets as apparently is happening right now you will know we are on stage four of the birth of a gestapo in the united states of america and to conclude this segment i will quote the famous poem by pastor martin niemuller a german during the nazi regime who movingly encapsulated the apathy of the people in germany including himself while hitler was gaining more and more power my memory doesn't fail me. I remember these things. Niemola wrote this. When the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. Then they locked up the social democrats. I remained silent. I was not a social democrat. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not protest. I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out. I was not a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to speak out for me. Well, first in America, they came for the conservative talk show hosts. 
and you do not speak up because you're not a conservative talk show host. But as the poem goes, by the time they come to you liberals, there is, there is no one left to speak up for you. This is the Savage Nation. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. All right, I'm going to give you some entertainment. We're going to go to about a third of the way into Countdown to Mecca. I'm going to read two pages, and I'm going to show you something about the Mossad and the underworld in my fictional mind. Page 116. So they go to a halfway house that Saul the gangster is funding. Saul motions for Jack and Doc to follow him. He led them into the public part of the halfway house rather than upstairs. He moved through the cafeteria to the far side of the counseling room. Boaz, Saul said to a man they noticed, could we see you for a moment? Of course, Mr. Minsky, he said in a low, slightly accented tone. He motioned toward a plain door in the corner. They followed him there, but Jack noticed a smile was growing on Doc's face. What, he asked his experienced old friend. Wait for it, Doc replied, further noticing that the door looked wooden but was actually metal. The manager brought them into a plain room that reminded Jack of the police station's interrogation room, except that it had a fridge, coffee machine, and simple computer table. Gents, Saul said as he sat, may I introduce Boaz Simonson. Boaz, this is Jack Hatfield and Doc Matson. Good to finally meet you, Boaz said, shaking each man's hand. Israeli, right, Doc said, as the two men shook, not bothering to check each other's strength. Boaz nodded, grinning. If the name doesn't peg me, the accent does. Hey, should we be talking like this in here, Jack wondered, crooking his head toward the seemingly thin walls, separating them from the recovering alcoholics, addicts, and prostitutes. Boaz's smile widened. You are now one of the most secure places in the city, Mr. Hatfield. This building was basically built around this room, and this room took us years to secure, design, and build. Uh, not to mention hundreds of thousands of dollars, Saul Minsky said. Doc, his own smile widening, crossed his arms and sat on the table edge. I'm guessing the money did not go into soundproofing. Saul Wing, Boaz was the Mossad, Boaz was the Mossad involved in the assassination of Schoenberg. Boaz shook his head. Absolutely not. Well, how would you know, Jack asked dubiously. Boaz looked to Saul the gangster. Saul looked to Jack. Because Boaz is this region's central Mossad sleeper agent, Saul motioned sweepingly. My entire staff is comprised of them. Jack shook his head. Saul, don't tell me. Jack said the alleged mob boss. You are the first people outside of my organization I've ever said this to. This facility is not a front for my crime activities. My crime activities are a front for these people. Genius, Dr. Old, you need a position where you could need sense. You need a position where you could seed sleeper agents all over the world, but also a base where both the underworld and feds would be watching your criminal activities so closely they'd miss the real operations. Hide in plain sight, Jack said. Saul nodded, yeah. We needed a Mossad presence here, especially after the events you were involved with over the last few years. So I moved my headquarters from the East Coast to the West Coast to find my reputation that preceded me. The move started bearing almost immediate fruit. And that's page 119 of Countdown to Mecca, where we find out that Saul Minsky, the Jewish gangster that I invented, is actually the head of a Mossad cell disguised as a Jewish gangster in order to elude the feds. There are plot twists that are original to the book. I, I never read that. Robert, did you ever read that anywhere or see it in a movie? Not even a Weinstein movie has that in it. It's very creative. I enjoyed writing it. I hope you'll enjoy reading it. And you can find it in almost every major bookstore now. That's good. So we've been discussing race because we don't, don't want to be seen as cowards by uh, Eric Holder, who's probably gone on to a very lucrative career back in the private sector, by the way, after stirring up the racial hatred that had been simper, you know, tamped down in the country. He did it. He did it and he did it. And then he got out of the f uh, kitchen. He couldn't take the heat. So he jumped back to a private law practice where he's probably making millions upon millions a year being rewarded by the legal profession for creating hatred in America unlike any we've seen in 40 years. Welcome to the United States of America under Barry Obama. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised.
And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. It is our number three, The Savage Nation. The man with quadruple ever ready batteries in his soul. <laughs> Michelle Obama would like students to monitor family members for racial insensitivity. Remember who did that? Old Adolf. Oh, I'm sorry. If all roads lead back to the same country of origin of these ideas where the uh, uh, Germans were told to rat out people in their own family who were not uh, politically correct, that's how it started. Did you, know? you didn't know that. Did you know that the Nazi party insisted that children report on their parents if they were insensitive to the Nazi party? Did you know that? Did you know that children were told to report on their parents if the parents said anything against the Nazi party or, Ad or Adolf Hitler? Michelle Obama would like students to monitor family members for racial insensitivity from the blaze. So-called First Lady Michelle Obama, and I say so-called because she's not acting like one. She's acting like a, let's put it to you this way. A first lady doesn't divide people. A first lady doesn't continue to stir the pot of hatred. A first lady does not have 72 private assistants. A first lady does not act as imperious as this. So so-called first lady, not behaving as such, is encouraging students to monitor their older relatives, friends, and coworkers for any racially insensitive comments they might make. The so-called first lady spoke on Friday to graduating high school students in Topeka, Kansas, Real geniuses. And then remarks released over the weekend. Mrs. Obama said students need to police family and friends. Police family and friends. Police family and friends. Because federal laws can only go so far in stopping racism. I'm not making any of this up. This is right out of the playbook. Here's what she said. Our laws may no longer separate us based on our skin color, but nothing in the Constitution says we have to eat together in the lunchroom or live together in the same neighborhoods. There's no court case against believing in stereotypes or thinking that certain kinds of hateful jokes or comments are funny, said the so-called first lady. To address these limitations in the law, Mrs. Obama asked students to take steps to, quote, drag my generation and your grandparents' generation along with you in the fight against racism. And she said this. Maybe that starts simply in your own family, when grandpa tells that off-color joke at Thanksgiving, or you've got an aunt that talks about those people, she said, well, you can politely inform them that they're talking about your friends. Or maybe it's when you go off to college and you decide to join a sorority or fraternity and you ask the question, how can we get more diversity in our next pledge class, she added. Or maybe it's years from now when you're on the job and you're the one who asks, do we really have all the voices and viewpoints we need at this table? Close quote. So that's the first lady's biggest job, is making sure that children rat out their parents and grandparents. Welcome to Hour 3. Let's go to the callers. Jim on WABC. Welcome to the program, Jim. What's on your mind? Hi, Michael. I'm a New York City teacher, and I just wanted to let you and your audience know about a taxpayer-funded workshop that many of the teachers are being sent to. It is called Undoing Racism. We had a gentleman come to our school and preview it for us, and the term white privilege was peppered throughout his talk, and he actually told us that the talk was based on the writings of Saul Alinsky. Well, I'm surprised they weren't directly uh, based upon the writings of Karl Marx. I mean, that's a step forward, that it's only Alinsky, not Marx. I was once subjected to this when I was a host on a local radio station, this is going back about 20 years, the management was forced to, to give, so it wasn't called diversity training, it was called something else, and they brought in some of the most racist low lowlifes you've ever seen in your life. None of them were white. They were black, and they were Asian, and they were, most of them were gay, and they were fascists. And they started the seminar on racial insensitivity by lecturing us First, they proudly said that we did this before the Annapolis graduating class and at West Point. And they said, uh, they started to teach us about the, the beauty of Buddhism. They lit a candle in the front of the room. They took a cross and put it behind the curtain. They lit a candle and they were smirking to each other because they were getting off on everybody. They saw what they were doing and no one said a word. So I figured I'm not a Buddhist. I didn't say anything. I'll just let them go on with their garbage. Then they started in with white privilege or something. like. It was the early days of that. 
I stood up and I said, hey, look, you guys, you have no training in any of this. You're nothing but a bunch of left-wing fascists. I'm not going to sit and listen to you. I am not required to listen to you. You're uneducated. You're not as smart as I am. You don't have my degrees. You have no right to tell me how to look at the world. I'm leaving. Everyone sat in dead silence. It was filled. It uh, must have been 200 people. Ask the people who were there. I walked out. Well, the manager of the company, of that radio station, rather, decided after that to never have sensitivity training again at the company. I only wish that there were some brave managers, company owners, store owners, uh, teachers unions that would stop this this left-wing disease before it kills all of us. Thanks for the call. Now let's go to John, KSFO Radio Online. John, next up on the Savage Nation. Dr. Savage. Yes, please, fire away. Yes, Dr. Savage, um, uh, I recently reread uh, Winston Churchill's six-volume magisterial study of the uh, Second World War, and uh, one of the things that people don't realize in the um, appeasement of Hitler uh, by um, uh, Chamberlain was that it was accompanied by a disarmament of Britain, France, and America at the same time. So we and Britain and France were disarming at the same time we allowed uh, Germany to arm and uh, I have to follow this by saying that the only Churchillian voice in America today is you, Doctor Savage. And uh, I've been—that's well, quite—that's quite a compliment. But I don't know that it's true. I don't compare myself to anybody, let alone Winston Churchill. But I do see the—I don't—I mean, do see the battle. There are others who see what's going on as clearly as I do. Now you're—you're you're referring mainly to the vision I have about the Islamo-fascists who are taking over the world, aren't you? Well, referring. Oh. Uh, the, the difference with Britain and, um, and America is that th they didn't have a disloyal uh, opposition. They had a loyal opposition. Y yes, that's right. The, labor's, the Labour Party was never disloyal. They were not anti-British. Of course, uh, they Obama were... is the enemy within. He's actually anti-American while posing as an American. Because if you, take an atta if you attack the majority of the nation every day by calling them racists... Is that not anti-Americanism? What else is it? Well, it's Wilsonian. It's exactly what happened in Europe. Wilson, uh, the, uh, 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 Wilson, uh, President Wilson, with his League of Nations, established race as the basis for understanding all national um, boundaries. That's why Czechoslovakia was carved up. No, I didn't know that. Yes, in fact, that was the, the explanation of everything. That's what balkanization means, is that recognizing races as separate entities instead of national entities, and that's why balkanization has led to the disaster that we see today. Well, but isn't Obama balkanizing America with his race talk? That's why race has always played it from the time of, of the Wilson Doctrine. So are you saying that Obama studied under this Wilson Doctrine and he's using the same techniques? Oh, no, it's, it's become second nature to the, uh, to the socialist cause. Are you a scholar of any kind, or are you just an interested uh, reader? I don't know what you do for a living. I studied in Britain. I've debated at the Oxford Union, something that you should have been allowed to have done. <laughs> no, you know, uh, that's the, you know about me being invited by the Cambridge Union and then being disinvited? I do. Of course. I was in Britain at the time. I was, I was uh, dumbfounded, you know. But, um, you know, Britain today is not what it was when I first went there in 1967. In 1967, it was a totally different country, Dr. Savage. Well, so was America in 1967. Well, I actually went to Britain to get away from, <laughs> to get away from America in 1967. Uh, are, you, are you originally born in America? I was indeed. Yes, I was indeed. And are, are you calling me? I know you're online. Are you calling me from a place in America or in Britain? I am. I'm calling from... Uh, uh, I'm a listener in the Bay Area calling. Uh, I listen to you on uh, KSFO. I see. And by the way, I was listening to your uh, reading from uh, the, uh, your, your most recent wonderful uh, Hatfield novel. And the Minsky part with him being the double agent, that was just brilliant. I was, I was dumbfounded as I listened on the phone to your reading it. I, was, I thought, what a... What well, nobody has ever done that fictional. No one has ever uh, posed the concept that the Mossad would use a gangster as a front in order to throw the, the, fed, the, the police off from their activities. One of the things about Churchill is that he was a painter, all right? He had an artistic streak in him. It gave yes, he, he was actually a fine painter. A very fine painter, and I, I feel that you've got that same thing. Your, your, your sense of, the, uh, of writing the novellas are very, very good. It gives you a, a, a common touch, which is really, really necessary to understand politics. So what do you currently do? Are you a retired man, John? Actually, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a known international artist, and uh, 
Um, you know, I've traveled throughout the Soviet Union and China. I went to China during the Cultural Revolution to study landscape painting, and uh, I've done a, a number of things. I've uh, resided. Well, I'm interested. I mean, here by your voice, you're highly educated, unlike mine. I sound like a longshoreman who never went to college, but that's part of my charm. I was going to call you when you spoke about Velikovsky and Lysenko. I thought, bloody hell, someone actually knows about this stuff. <laughs> there's, an awful lot, there's an awful lot that I read you that has to be kept. You know, the hardest... Hey, look, John, you representing the 0.1% of my audience. I, I Remember what I said earlier that I have to appeal to the highbrow and the lowbrow all at once from Joe Sixpack, from Joe Sixpack to the intelligentsia. In virtually every statement, I have to think of this audience. That's what mass communication is all about. So apparently you're one of the 0.1% of the listeners. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I would love to see some of your paintings. Is there any way that you could stay on the line and uh, perhaps share your email address with Robert or, or with Jim so we can communicate? Yes, I'd love to. I, I would be honored. I'd be honored to do that. And I'll tell you what, I'll trade you one of my amateur watercolors for, <laughs> for, one, of your, for one of your paintings. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever see the childish watercolors I've been painting, I think you'd be embarrassed to say that I have any artistic <laughs> sensibility. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. You know, it's one of the things about uh, people of very high intellect is that they also have a they have this common touch. They have a little bit of the proletarian in them. I mean, that's what made Churchill so interesting as well. If I can walk with King, if you can walk with kings and never lose the common touch, then you will be a man, my my son. Remember Kipling's great poem. Very good, Kipling. Very good. Kipling, Kipling, Kipling. Well, I'm going to send you a copy of Countdown to Mecca. I don't know if you've read it yet. I think of all people, you'd love reading it. I'm glad you heard the uh, middle passage from the book. And I look forward to receiving your email so we can communicate and perhaps exchange paintings. Certainly. Thank you for calling the show. That was great. Unbelievable. 18 minutes after the hour, I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. I want to read you a paragraph, and then I'll tell you where it was written. And it goes like this. Uh, let's see. Now quasi-Marxist do-gooders, fearing for their lives, pick on the innocent to protect the liberty of the guilty. Overrun by the insanity of their own policies of ultra-tolerance, they choose intolerance as a quick defense. The once proud British of Churchill, the victors of the Battle of Britain, where so many flowers of Cambridge and Oxford nobly sacrificed their lives, now reduced to broken flower pots of people ruling Britannia overrun by people who hate them, hate their race, hate their whiteness. The broken shards of England cho chose to condemn an American patriot, a man who speaks of borders of language of culture. He is the enemy of the shards of England's pride. He is now the sum total of all that threatens the island's survival. This free spirit ensnared by the descendants of those bold Norsemen now fallen, their clay feet crumbling. That was the introduction to Bandon Britain. I did that book. I don't even know how I did it in such a short period of time. It's not available for sale. I'm not selling your book. But believe me, I've been fighting the free speech battle for quite a while. And I'm proud to tell you I'm the only member of the American media still prohibited from entering Britain, even though the conservatives won. It's, it's a damn shame. Justin, <clears throat> sorry about that. I ate too many uh, andami seeds just now. I, I ate uh, corn and andami seeds in a salad. Darn that andami. Justin on WVLK Radio, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Dr. Savage, uh, my grandfather passed away about a week ago, um, and at the funeral I heard a great story involving my grandfather and someone named Meyer Lansky, who I'd never heard of before. You said, wait, wait you're telling me your father, was in, your father was in the rackets? Your grandfather was in the rackets? My great-grandfather apparently used to own a speakeasy in Chinatown and went to school with Meyer Lansky. The story is that um, he had a speakeasy next to near another speakeasy owned by either Maya Lansky or an associate of Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky knew my great grandfather, came to him. I won't, my great grandfather's name was Danny. He said, Danny, listen, I've known you for a very long time, but you have to shut down. Apparently, someone else had tried to tell my great grandfather to shut down, and he said, no, 
But when Meyer Lansky came and asked him to shut down, he shut down real fast. Well, Meyer Lansky was the head of um, Murder Incorporated, the Jewish gang, Murder Inc. Murder Inc. You know that. Exactly. And I so I, are you calling to ask me if Meyer Lansky inspired my fictional character, Saul Minsky? Exactly. Somewhat. I took a few different derivative names and put them together and mixed a few concepts, conceptualizations together and came up with a character called Saul Minsky. He seems to be, attract a lot of interest in the book Countdown to Mecca. I don't know why everyone likes the gangster more than they like the hooker or the clown or the character who was the hero, Jack Hatfield. <laughs> why, why is America obsessed with my character, Saul Minsky? I don't know. So what did your grandfather do when they shut him down? Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm really not sure it was my great-grandfather. Um, I know. Well, what, you know what, business did, what business did he go into? What, did he open a flower shop? Uh, no, he owned several rental properties, um, and I think that's ended up what he's doing. And then my grandfather ended up becoming an accountant. And uh, <laughs> well, Maya Lansky was the accountant of organized crime. <laughs> he was. Yeah, he, he was. He was allegedly a criminal genius who never wrote anything down, so the police couldn't entrap him. He was smart enough to remember all his numbers in his head. Would you believe that? But let's not forget that he was a certifiable bad man. He was an evil man, not to be glorified. I want to be very clear about that. There tends to be a, a slippage in America today where gangsters are being glorified as they're some kind of folk hero. They're not. They're the garbage of our society. They're not to be looked up to. We have that in the thug se segment of society and even in the white collar class. Anyway, uh, Justin, I'm going to send you Countdown to Mecca where you can see a little bit more about Saul Minsky the Mossad double agent and how he plays out to save the world. It's a good book. I'll be right back. Be here or be nowhere. It's the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. The federal government has in the past provided the state and local law enforcement agencies. You know, we've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like it was an occupying force as opposed to a force that's part of the community that's protecting them and serving them. can alienate and intimidate local residents and send the wrong message. So we're going to prohibit some equipment made for the battlefield that is not appropriate for local police departments. Those that do not know the history are condemned to repeat it, so I'm giving you a little historical music, the Horst Vessel song of the uh, Nazi party, uh, as a little background music to the uh, soft-spoken president of the United States of America circa 2014, 2015. Of course he's not a Nazi. Are you crazy? Why, there are no concentration camps. Not at all. There are no brown shirts in the streets. Not at all. It's done for, um, let us say, attracting your attention. Then maybe you'll break through the fog of confusion, doubt, and illusion. The illusion created by the grand illusionist Barack Obama. Barack Obama is the greatest illusionist in the history of the presidency. Make no mistake about it, he's a grand illusionist. And instead of screaming in German, he talks softly. And he threatens everyone in the United States of America on a daily basis with his reign of terror while not threatening ISIS. ISIS is taking over one city after another. And he and his sorority are telling us that they don't stay awake worrying about it at night. It's nothing. I want to play a soundbite of the worst, almost a monster. Eric Holder is probably one of the most evil men in American history. And I want you to listen to what this demonic man said before he retired oh, a while ago. Listen to this. One cannot truly understand... America without understanding the historical experience of black people in this nation. Simply put, to get to the heart of this country, one must examine its racial soul. Though this nation has proudly thought of itself as a ethnic melting pot, in things racial we have always been and we, I believe, continue to be in too many ways essentially a nation of cowards. Okay, so we're a nation of cowards because he wants a conversation on race. Well, let's have a conversation on race on the Savage Nation. We've been having a conversation on race ever since Obama triggered Ferguson. We've been having a conversation on race ever since Holder and Obama triggered the burning of Baltimore. We've been having a conversation on race ever since we've seen what this 
administration is doing and intends to do. So I say let's continue our cowardly discussion of race on the program. And there's no better way to continue this conversation of race, uh, this, this cowardly conversation of race, than to focus on what Obama just did last night. Remember Loretta Lynch, how the Republicans put up a fake fight and said that they are going to oppose her? Well, she's now in there, and I warned you she was worse than a holder. Didn't I tell you she was going to be worse than a holder because she's a woman? She's got a double going for her. She's got a double protexia around her. So now she announces immediately, not that she's going to look into disarming the gangs in the cities, not that she's going to look into the communist front groups that were responsible for all the violence and the terrorism in our streets, but she's going to grant $163 million to these, these thuggish groups. The ACLU is a criminal organization, as you know, with law degrees. They're the cowardly side of the, of the uh, revolution. The ACLU are the cowards who hide behind law degrees. They work with the actual street thugs who do the damage. Do you understand how this works? So she's going to put in new guidelines in cities to teach police how to behave toward the gangs. Now that leads us to the Gestapo is born. Upon becoming Chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler had appointed Hermann Göring as Minister of the Interior for the State of Prussia. As Minister of the Interior, Göring thereby had control of the police. That's the Attorney General. She's the she's the fundamentally the Minister of the Interior. The Attorney General is our Minister of the Interior. So in Germany, Göring had control of the police. She doesn't have control of our local police because we have a constitution, we have state governments which are supposed to function separately from the federal government to avoid a dictatorship. But we have a man who was a madman in the White House, surrounded by demagogues who want to take over every aspect of our lives. The first thing Goring did was to prohibit regular, uniformed police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out in the streets. So I said, well, what does that have to do with America? There are no Nazi brown shirts. Yes, there are. They're the gangs. They're the thugs who just burnt Baltimore. They are the brown shirts. They burnt Baltimore. First they tried Ferguson and they got away with it. Then they had the president covering for them, putting out the false narrative of the gentle giant, who was actually a criminal, trying to kill a cop. So he covered for them, and these thugs are now controlling Ferguson and Baltimore. And so let's go back again to history, Goring. First thing he did was prohibit regular uniformed police from interfering with Nazi brown shirts out in the streets. This meant that innocent German citizens had no one to turn to as they were being beaten up by rowdy young stormtroopers. Well, do we have stormtroopers? No, we don't have rowdy young stormtroopers. We have rowdy young thugs, inner city thugs. And what did these young stormtroopers do? These young Nazi toughs took full advantage of police leniency to loot shops at will and terrorize Jews or anyone else unfortunate enough to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, did they loot in Ferguson? You betcha. Did they loot in Baltimore? You betcha. Did they terrorize people? You betcha. So what's the parallel, boys and girls? The Gestapo was born in Germany. Obama is giving birth to a Gestapo in America. His gangs are called victims. The police are called thugs. He's reversed everything. Now, that's, that's just one topic. Now, we have another story that I have to talk about. I've still not seen any photographs or video, even B-roll, of the so-called killing of Abu Sayyaf, the key ISIS figure, killed in a daring U.S. raid by Delta forces, where all of our troops returned safely. They even captured his wife. And they captured heavy intelligence. I'd like to believe it's true, but given that Obama's a liar, and given that this report about this special operations uh, uh, raid in eastern Syria overnight Friday to Saturday came after they took another city, I think it's just as likely to be Capricorn 1 and propaganda. I hope I'm wrong. But what good did it do? They took him. Let's say they did take him. The next day, the next city fell. And here's another question about the so-called war being run by the golfer moron in the White House, Satan. Are you ready for this one? The victory parade after they took Ramadi. I'm talking about ISIS. 
a column a half a mile long of their pickup trucks with machine guns. One A-10 could have wrecked the entire column, destroyed them. One sortie by one airplane could have wiped out the entire column. Why the hell didn't Obama launch that A-10? Because they're on our side. I am telling you right now that this is the biggest scam in your life. There's no explanation for this. And further proof to my suspicion that ISIS is actually being funded by the United States government is this. Do you remember last week the Pentagon asked the media to scrap old footage of ISIS columns? Did you hear this? Do you remember what they said? Pentagon spokesmouth Colonel Stephen Warren said, please stop using stock footage that makes the terror army seem more mobile and more formidable than they say it actually is. He said they don't travel like that anymore. And he said, quote, one Toyota speeding down the road by itself at night with his headlights off would be a more accurate image. Really, Mr. Spokesman Colonel Stephen Warren, yesterday I saw a column of Toyotas a half a mile long, and you and your brave air boys did nothing. They were told to stand down the same way they were told to stand down in Benghazi by the... I don't know. I can't say it. I really would like to say what I don't understand how the Republicans let him get away with it. The answer is because they're the same. Don't you understand there is no Republican Party? There's no Democrat Party? Don't you understand yet that it's a single block of a ruling class and we're the moron serfs? And it's so bad that if my suspicion is correct, that ISIS is an arm of the United States government, in other words, a proxy army, that we, the citizens of this country, by permitting the charlatan in the White House to get away with this charade of a war against ISIS, we are responsible for the kidnappings. We're responsible for the rapes of children. We're responsible for the slavery of non-Muslims. We are the devil themselves for letting this character get away with it without demanding more. Now, of course, you say, what can I do? I understand that. You saw that George Staphylococcus is nothing but a paid whore. We understood that from day one. Did he ever look like anything but a paid whore? I mean, you're shocked that he's a paid whore and gave money to the Clinton Foundation? You're shocked that George Stephanopoulos looks like a male escort? He's been a male escort of the uh, Democrat Party from the day he started. He never was a journalist. Never. He's always been a pretty boy uh, escort for the Democrat Party. We have now in America what I've said for 10 years. We have reporters who suddenly call themselves journalists who are nothing more than fifth columnists disguised as members of the fourth estate. We have no fourth estate. I am the fourth estate. Drudge is the fourth estate. About 10 websites of the fourth estate. That's it. There is no fourth estate. Do you know what the fourth estate is? Okay, it's the fourth estate. We're supposed to stick our fingers into the side of the liars in government. We're supposed to be those who keep them in line. We're supposed to be the burr in the saddle of ABC, CBS, NBC, and NYT. But when we become the same as them and we're not the burr in the saddle, what are we? Prostitutes. And so, therefore, I say to you, going back, circling back to my first story, on the headline, we were told over the weekend that the great Delta Force... Uh, killed a key ISIS figure, Abu Sayyaf, and then they captured his wife and great intelligence, and all the Delta forces came home without a scratch on their shiny badges. Well, I hope it's true, but we haven't seen one picture yet. Now, if it is true and we haven't seen one picture yet, the only re reason is is because Harvey Weinstein is still in con. He's probably on a yacht enjoying an after party from the film festival, and he hasn't gotten back to make the movie yet to show it uh, to show us Capricorn 2, uh, produced by Obama Inc., the new worldwide uh, dictatorship that's emerging. You got the race hater in the White House every day now giving a speech, turning black against white, white against black, black against Asian, Asian against black, every day in every way, the same rotten, stinking people running the world. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. The Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I, Michael Savage, trust to buy my gold and silver from. Here we have ISIS taking over one major city after another, and this clown is talking about climate change posing a threat uh, to national security. Only in America could it get away with it because we no longer have a fourth estate. We have a fifth column with a single party of left-wing demagogues running everything from top to bottom. Welcome to the show, hour number two. Hour number one, I spent explaining to you what went on 
in Germany in the 1930s on the birth of the Gestapo under Adolf Hitler, how it was done sta step by step, st step by step, stage by stage. And I compared it to what he's doing to our police in this country, uh, step by step, day by day, city by city. I'm not going to repeat myself. It'll be up on the, uh, I suppose it'll be webcast, however they do this, podcast on various and sundry websites before the end of the day. I suggest you listen to it and share it with people. You're very lucky that you have me on the radio. I rarely blow my own horn. People think I'm very egotistical and I do too much of it, but you actually don't know I don't do much of it at all. The thing is, is that were it not for the quirks of the socialist government that you're living in, you wouldn't even be hearing me. I would have been a college professor of ethnobotany and never heard from, except in scholarly circles. But because they cauterized me through the fascism of liberalism and drove me away from the universities, I come before you fully developed and fully educated in so many areas. And as a result, I see the truth and I don't wait. Now, it has been written that God sees the truth but waits. Thomas Mann wrote that in one of his novel, short stories. I was very impressed with it. And it was about the nihilism of Germany after World War I, before uh, the Nazis arose, during the liberal Weimar Republic. The country was out of control. Liberalism had destroyed the social order. Young gangs were roving the streets of Germany doing what they're doing today in America. And it was fascism that came along because the people were demanding law and order. And now we have the grand illusionist that we're dealing with. And I, you know what's hard for me to believe? Is that every day he gets worse. It's not as though... See, this is a pathology here we're dealing with. We're actually dealing with a very ill man. He is so demonically ill that he doesn't even realize what... Does he realize what he's doing, I ask myself every day? How can a man get up every day and while looking at himself in the... You get up, wash your face, go to the bathroom, you look at yourself in the mirror, you comb your hair, brush your teeth, whatever. Does he say to himself, what can I do to destroy white America today? How can I destroy the power structure every day? How can I weaken this country even further? Is that what he's doing? Because there's no other explanation for his activities. It's as though a man wakes up every day and says, how can I weaken the European-American dominance of this country? How can I make this country less racist, which is a code word for weakening white America? I'm sorry, you want a conversation on race? Didn't Eric Holder say we're cowards? Didn't Eric Holder say that we're too cowardly to have a discussion on race? Well, let's have a discussion on race. He wants us to talk about it. I am talking about it. I am so sick and tired of hearing how evil white men are. I am so sick and tired of hearing how oppressed the black people are. I am so sick and tired of hearing how great every Hispanic is that I want to have a conversation on race. So that's what we're doing. We're having a conversation on race. Since Eric Holder said that we're all cowards on it. White men are evil. Hispanics are all Einsteins. And black men are all oppressed. That's the, that's the narrative every day. And your poor daughter goes to college. This poor child you gave birth to has to go and listen to these communist cockamamie lunatics who tell her she has white privilege. She could have multiple sclerosis and come from a poor home. They'll tell her if she's European-American, she has white, white privilege. That's what your daughter has to put up with, this massive Soviet-style propaganda under this grand illusionist. Now, if it's too much for you, I accept that. I accept it. I look around, I see people in the streets, they don't want to know any of this. I have neighbors who are the biggest idiots I've ever seen in my life. They don't listen to the radio. They don't watch television. They actually proudly say, well, I don't no, I, I don't watch TV news. Oh, I, I don't listen to no radio. Huh? I only listen to NPR. Good for you. National Public Radio. You mean National Obama Radio, don't you? you remember there was a day when the Republican Party tried to defund NPR? What happened to those days? Savage.